Hey, it's Tim. Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk. The first time on the channel? Welcome. On this channel, you find trucking SUV news, reviews, and cool things I do. So hit subscribe, stick around, and stay with us. It's a good time. We have fun on this channel. So in this video, I'm going to respond to some questions that were asked about a post I put out. So I plan on reaching out to Chevrolet, which I have done, about a variety of questions you guys have asked. And in this video, I'm going to give you my responses to the questions that I know the answers to and to the ones they probably won't answer. But I gotta tell you what, the response was remarkable. I had 83 different responses, I think, on total count. And I've shipped off a list of questions. It's like two pages in a Word document. So I'm expecting some feedback from Chevrolet in the next couple weeks or so as they round up engineers, as they decide how they can answer questions, things like that. So like, first, thank you, thank you, thank you for all those questions because, wow, you guys asked some really good ones and I'm hoping to get all those answers for you. But before further ado, let me go ahead and answer the questions that I can answer and I'll kind of put it on the screen of the post. We'll kind of talk through these. So one of the first questions I got was, uh, not I guess one of the first questions I got, or the one I get a lot, is about the interior. So a lot of people are like, well, hey, the, the Tahoe and Suburban have really nice interiors. Why did the Chevrolet Silverado have such bad interior when it first came out, the redesign in 2019? Well, it, the reality of that, and well, that they can't really answer that, is that at that time, interiors weren't really that important of a truck buying decision. It really only changed when Ram 1500 came out and their interior was amazing. And so we got to understand is that the Chevrolet did improve their interiors and the GMC Sierra does have a better interior. It was just an evolutionary thing where Ram went revolutionary. So now when you look at these trucks comparison wise, you can really see how much better the Ram interior is than the Chevrolet interior is. But it's just shocking because nobody saw that coming. So in Chevy's defense, they were kind of blindsided by that. And so if you look back in the time, in hindsight 30-30, you, you can say, oh, well, hey, they should have done a better job. I don't know. At the time, that wasn't that big of a thing. And so now the world's changed. Things have changed. And I would argue that there's a lot of Chevy customers that still like the Chevy interiors. So no matter what you think of the interior, that's just kind of what happened. And it's not really anybody's fault. It's just things just happened. And all of a sudden, they got caught with their pants down. Well, happens to all of us. Uh, another question that I get asked quite a bit is, would it be nice if Chevy and GMC made the 6.2 and option all trim levels? And a lot of times, it talks about options and trim levels, engines, there's options about different transmissions, different engines, things like that. And that's all a marketing you know, kind of department questions. I mean, they're trying to figure out how to put the right engine with the right package, offer the right customer with the right price, because you know they may discount the 6.2 liter upgrade, Right, so they may only call. Yeah, it's going to cost two, three thousand dollars more. In reality, it may be four thousand dollars more, but they're hiding some of that cost in the accessories and the higher trim level that they offer that truck in. And so they're always managing that kind of, you know, in a way to divide what feels like value to you, but also make sure they have enough profit there. So there's a lot of times it gets frustrating that you can't get a certain engine or certain transmission in a certain configuration. But there's a lot of math behind the scenes on budget and pricing, and and every truck manufacturer has this. They all have the same kind of profit margin they're trying to hit. So it's basically every truck every truck is built with the same budget, the same profit margin, and then they figure out the packaging to hit those marks. Uh, Ford does it, Ram does it, Toyota does it, Nissan does it, everybody has the same thing. And everybody cuts corners in different ways to make that mark. So if you've ever taken like four or five trucks driven around and really spent time with them, you'll start seeing differences. That's where one manufacturer maybe cut a corner here the other one didn't cut the corner over here, but then they hit that same price mark. So they're always trying to, it's just a really a budget game. It's a business game. So that's why you don't see the 6.2 throughout, or you don't see this engine throughout. They're really trying to make sure they can get that budget hit right. And also understand that the higher volume is a 5.3 liter. And so 6.2 is going to cost them a little more money to build because it's not a high volume as a 5.3. So you have a little bit of supply and demand and also economics of scale. So I want to go to an email I got. And I thought that was interesting because this... Uh, email, I've, I've dealt with this question before. And the question is, why do they still put independent suspension heavy duty trucks and use tie rods the size of toothpicks? So if you search on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of trucks that have uh, tie rods that snap. And when they snap, the wheels kind of, the, the, the camera in, they, they, I don't know what you say, they come in like this is what I'm trying to say. And uh, so uh, typically you see these a lot when people are doing um, tractor tow tests. They're doing the, the sled sled. But a lead sled on the country fair, my truck can outtow your truck, and they take off. Well, so let's talk about a few things here. Let's unpack this question a little bit. So Chevy's been using independent suspension, front suspension, on heavy-duty trucks and on half-ton trucks for decades. My 1962 out there has independent suspension. 
they just decided back in the 40s and 50s that the independent suspension was a better way to go because they think that ride quality is more important than the solid rear axles. And that's the way Chevy's been for, gosh, 50, 60 years, somewhere in that range. And so they've always prioritized the ride comfort for over the big solid axle. Now that causes some problems. And it causes problems when you overload a truck. So if you look at like um, county fairs, like I say, when they snap those tie rods, it's from the fact when you overload that truck. And so the truck is built tie rods, rear suspension, the rear differential, the U-joints, the brakes, everything to get a max towing number. And so when you exceed that, that's when you have problems with tie rods. And that's why, you know, maybe the size of toothpicks, but that tie rod, tie rod size is built for that towing capacity and it's built to keep that weight down. So weight is always the enemy of any full-size truck, an MDU truck. The, you know, trucks are basically aerodynamic-wise, they're a brick on wheels. So the more weight you add to it, well, the more it's not gonna get good fuel economy. So you're you're constantly doing this battle between, you wanna make it really durable and heavy duty and all this kind of stuff, but if you add all this additional weight, more than the truck's capable of, of what you're gonna rate it as, then you have a lot less fuel economy. So you have customers bitching about both sides, or this competing interest. And so I think that's what you'll find. That's why you find the, those tie rod sizes. Now I have talked to some friends and they make, make a sleeve that goes over that tie rod. So if you do plan on overloading your truck or showing off county fair, uh, you can get these tie rod sleeves that go on there and then prove, this, prove the tie rods that don't snap. But basically whenever you overload this truck, it's gonna have problems. And because it's independent front suspension, you could argue it's gonna have more problems than say Ford and Ram with their solid front axles. But don't overload your truck, you have no problem. It's kind of the argument there. Uh, why don't they use a better chassis coating to prevent rust? I've heard this question before in the comments and it's not the first time I've heard this. So if you don't know, uh, Chevy and GMC use a wax coating, whereas Ford, Ram, Toyota, Nissan use an E-coating as a spray coating. So they take the frame, and this is why the frame's got holes, take the frame, they clip it on to some conveyor belt, they dip it in E-coating, flip it around and dip it in E-coating, let that set and dry, and then they put it through the factory. That's what Ram or else does. Uh, Chevy's got a wax coating. They apply this wax coating on the truck. They still have the holes for the conveyor belt moving around, but the wax coating goes there. And so what happens there is the wax coating versus E-coating. This It's an ongoing discussion, ongoing argument if you ask certain people, uh, ongoing issues. And what's interesting is if you look at some of the million mile trucks I've done, which I'll link to a series above, you'll see some of them had rust, some didn't have rust as much, some, but they basically kind of all did and they were all... You know, yeah, all southern tech trucks, so there's an issue with maybe northern trucks and rust. Although I did find a million mile Silverado in Flint, Michigan. I will be doing that story that has no rust. So that's going to be an interesting one. But so the idea is with the e-coating, and, and this is the argument. So GM says, if you take an e-coating on the frame, and it, I don't know, I can have an example, but let's say this blue on my chapstick, because I need chapstick like crazy these days. Uh, if, if, you, if you make a mark on this, it's always gonna have a mark, always gonna have a scratch. And when you put coatings on this, it keeps the rust off. If you scratch it, that invites rust in because you're allowing moisture and air to get to that. So scratching that frame would invite rust. So that's GM's argument is that the wax coating, when you scratch the wax coating, it the wax will eventually fill back in that scratch mark. And so they feel like their wax coating is superior because as the frame hits, if you bottom it out on a trail, if you ride over a rock or something and that wax coating gets cut, that that wax coating will actually grow back in and prevent rust in the truck. Now the rest of the manufacturers, they don't do it. They, they feel like e-coating and put that on, you know, there's a thickness issue there because again, paint is heavy and coatings are heavy, so you can't add more weight. Again, weight trucks, we talked about this earlier. So they feel like that they put the right amount of coating in and if it scratches, it scratches, a little rust on the frame, a little surface rust isn't that big of a deal to them. And so that, that's their issue there. And so it's that's what's going on. That's what Chevy says. That they feel like their wax coating is superior because as you, as you damage that frame, that wax will rejoin over. And if you have uh, E coating, that's never gonna be the case. Once you scratch it, you're done. So it, it is interesting uh, discussion to have. And it, it is interesting um, talking about, some other stuff, talk about frames lately. I've learned a lot on this. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, th this is an interesting question. Why does the chassis of the Colorado have a hole directly above the bump stop? 
And so this was, if you look at the uh, frame bending videos, which I'll link above, there's a ZR2. And basically the guy has a has bent the frame. He's trailering an uh, overland trailer. And really the story is he's going too fast on a trail. And as he's doing these whoops, the trailer is putting additional force on the truck. Every time he goes up those whoops, all this weight is putting on the trucks. And so what happens is at that point, the frame bends. Now you're thinking, oh my gosh, the trailer's got to bend first. No, it's the it's physics. It's it's the trailer's riding fine. It's the trailer putting all this weight back on the frame that's happening. And so frames are built so they bend. Frames are built so they bend around the rear axle. That's that's the design of all frames. Because in a rear end accident, when I hit rear end, I want this frame to go down instead of going up and going in through the cab or going straight and all that momentum goes right into my head and so i'm flying back and forth with a bunch of whiplash if you look at old trucks like 80s and 70s trucks and 90s trucks if you ever got in a rear end accident with those you had a lot of whiplash issues right if you ever see a bunch of videos online watch a crash test video of the 70s 80s trucks you'll find that they that that occupant his head is flying over the place and so they want the inertia of that crash bend that frame and to keep all the inertia going away from that cabin. They want that cockpit in that cabin, the occupant to be not whiplash, not be thrown around. So there's there's always this argument, though, about, you know, the old frames are stronger and better because they don't bend like that. But the trucks, well, the trucks aren't as safe. And so how do you feel about that? Now, there's a hole right there. And as you may have watched in the frame video I did with the expert there, holes in frames are, everybody's got them. Everybody's got holes in frames. There's no frame out there without holes. Holes are done by conveyance, by taking around the factory. You can look at uh, welding inspection points. Sometimes you got to pass electric, you know, electrical wiring through there. Sometimes you need a hole to pass a tool through to connect something. So that's what these frames have. And so the game with, with the frame engineers is that they're going to locate these holes in the places throughout the frame where the frame doesn't need the extra support. It's a spot on the frame where they don't need extra support. So they're going to they're going to reinforce the, the what they call the hot zones. So the hot zones are where a lot of activity happens, like crash testing or a lot of weight or whatever. So they're going to reinforce those hot zones to make those hot zones as strong as they can. And they're going to make them thinner because high strength steel is stronger than the older steel, but it's thinner. So they're going to make them thinner, take some weight out, but they also make sure those are really reinforced. And then they go back and look at the cold places. The cold places are where you don't really, it's not that you don't care what happens to it, but it's not as um, necessary for something to happen to it. So you're looking at places where, you know, if you were to damage that, it'd be fine. So in this case, there's a hole directly below the bump stop and that's right above the, the springs, which is right above, or the, the, the DSVV shocks in this case, and the leaf springs, and it's right above the rear axle. Well, that, that hole in that place, you well, it's ideal, right? I mean, that's an ideal placement because in a rear end collision, bam, that hole just, it just collapses. So who cares, you know, that's, that's the primary purpose of it of that spot of the frame is for that rear end collision. That, that's what that spot is. Most of your weight bearing is towards kind of the, the front of the frame and the cab, okay? And then when you get towards the back of the frame, all frames go thinner in the back of the frame because the weight bearing needs in the back of the frame are substantially less than in the middle and the front of the cab. And so when you put stuff in of the truck, you're, when you put payload in, in the bed, you're really pushing down on the front of that frame. You're really pushing down the truck like this. So, you know, they put all the reinforcement in front of the axle to keep all that weight in that payload. Once you get towards the middle of the axle, the weight kind of distributes a little bit differently. And once you get towards the back, well, you know, if, if you load your truck like this and you put all 50 gallon drums along your tailgate, well, obviously something's going to happen. That's why you just push them towards the front of the cab because that's all your structures up there. And so actually, I think what's interesting in this question is, I think the reverse is true. That hole is perfect. And that hole is ideal um, because of crash states, because of how you load stuff. And so I think that hole was a smart placement. Now, there's a lot of conversation that says, well, that's a designing flaw, engineering flaw. They shouldn't have done that. You know, why even do it there? It's kind of ridiculous. And I actually have a Nissan Frontier outside. I'm going to go look at it in a second. But, you know, it's why is that hole there from frame manufacturers to help those, all these different frames are the same. And that's why that hole's there. That's why it makes the most sense. And if it that's a spot where that that frame actually on that ZR2 did the right thing, I know it's it's bizarre to think that way. In the comments, you completely disagree with me, but that frame did the right thing. It bent to allow that um, trailer not to push through in the cabin and not to cause a damage, and it, it did its job. Now there's some arguments saying that the engineers need to beef that up so the frame doesn't go down. 
well, there's a situation where that's a mid-sized truck, and the mid-sized truck needs different than the full-sized truck needs. I've had some people that say, hey, well, wh- well, clearly the guy told the wrong thing. If you want to tow a trailer like that off-road, you better use a full-size, and my full-size truck wouldn't do that. Well, it's a completely different world. Like, a mid-sized truck isn't the same at all of a full-size truck. The customer needs are different. The towing needs are different. The powertrain is different. I mean, the expectations are different, so they're that's really not apples to apples comparisons. You can't just say, well, a Colorado is just a smaller version of Silverado because, frankly, that's never been closer to being incorrect than it is today because it is there's such a wide difference. And the midsize truck market is one of the fastest growing truck, truck markets because the customers don't need all the capability of the full-size trucks as much as they used to. And they're, frankly, a lot of people are tired of parking them. So there's differences there. Um, and I want to get to this is another question here that I thought was pretty interesting that's been kind of back and forth in the news. And it says, uh, uh, it's about the coronavirus and about GM's response to respirators. As you know, President Trump like chided them for not getting on the board faster and, and saying they should have done a better job. And they had to prompt him again because it's Mary Bear is slow. And frankly, that's not true. Um, if you do some research into Ventric, um, Ventric Systems, I think that's what they call them, um, that's the CEO. And I'll link to an article down below that Chevy shared as well that I've, I've been reading. And the CEO for the respirator company said no. We were working already together. We were already working full speed, and no GM wasn't price gouging. And so he just had some bad information, and there's some bad information about GM because of that. And frankly, that's just, it's completely inaccurate. And I will be fighting those inaccuracies when I see them in comments because, you know, let, let's discuss things that are facts and not these inaccuracies. And so GMs are working very hard to make these, uh, fr- these ventilators happen. You know, working very hard with the different companies, working on pricing. That it's really, really admirable what they're doing. And uh, this guy also want to know why can't they stop relying on government funds? Which I think is interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, still hate about GM taking bailout money, and I think what's interesting is that GM, Chrysler, and Ford all took bailout money. Um, if you look at the, if you look back in time, they they all took some sort of relief. 2008 is man, that was a terrible year. If you guys were alive and are or working in that year, or whatever the case would be, that was a really tough span. And I think one of the important things you got to remember from that is, and Ford's uh, CEO at the time, was it CEO or uh, President Bill Ford, I think he even said as well, that if Ford, if GM didn't take the bailout funds, Ford would have taken up more of them. And it's not because GM was a bad business, or Crest was a bad business, or Ford was a bad business. I mean, you could argue all three of them at that time weren't doing the right thing. They weren't building small, efficient cars, and they were building big gigantic SUVs and there's all this argument about the uh, fuel economy and the wrong product for the wrong customer and whatever you want to say but what it comes down to is it comes down to suppliers so um, one thing I'm gonna do more in this channel is discuss suppliers because they make a big difference and so everybody uses uh, similar suppliers so if you look at the uh, Takata ba- airbag recall this is a great example the Takata airbag recall uh, affected all these manufacturers. People were like, well, Toyota just recalled all these airbags. They're just terrible products. The quality went way downhill. Well, Takata recalled the airbags, and because there's only two airbag manufacturers in the world, and Takata is the biggest one, guess what? Ford and Chevy and Toyota, they all recalled the airbags because it was the one supplier. That's a great example. So if you look at frames, there's only a couple different frame suppliers. There's only a couple different, uh, you know, uh, airbags. There's only a couple different. Uh, oil pumps there's only a couple of different you know air filters or whatever you want to say uh, different suppliers and so when you have a supplier that's got an issue with one part it can impact them all and it's a lot of times that Toyota and GM and Ford and everybody gets dinged on recalls when it really is a supplier issue and so you know the supplier made a mistake and that's what happens these the truck has really got the brand of the company on the front of it and it's got the engineering and design for the company but it's really a culmination of different parts that makes the truck happen. And so that's the biggest thing with the bailout money was that if GM didn't get bailed out and Chrysler didn't get bailed out, Ford would have got would have gotten in trouble because they would have ran out of parts. They would have ran out of parts that had nothing to sell. If you had nothing to sell, well, you got to go through bankruptcy. That's what's got to happen. So um, part suppliers are the one of the biggest reasons like that the recession jobs were saved was because they were able to get money to keep part suppliers in business and mom, even mom and pop part suppliers were still doing stuff, and they were able to keep keep around. So, um, and, and currently GM doesn't use any government funds. That's not accurate. Um, the last question, and this actually comes up more than you think. 
when are they going to put out a decent commercial? <laughs> That's, I had a guy for the longest time that always wanted to show me videos of Like a Rock. He wanted me to play Like a Rock every time I had a Chevy uh, review. And I'm like, it's copyright. Like, I can't play the commercial all the time. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I do get that all the time. It is, it is pretty funny. Um, I wanted to say there was something else. Oh, the Blazer name. This this comes up quite a bit. Why does Chevy use the Blazer name again? And uh, I, and they used re reuse the Hummer name again. The head of uh, marketing has been quoted as saying this. They feel like they have a lot of brand equity in Blazer and Hummer. People know these names already, and so they feel like they can work. They don't have to work as hard to get those that name in people's minds. So why not take a new product and put the old name on it? And that way, the, all the brand equity is already done. People already know those names and instead of trying to building up a new name. So, like, do you remember the Chevy Aveo? Maybe not. But do you remember the Chevy Blazer? You do. And so while it may piss you off that they're using a, a old name on a new product and it's not the same product at all, it does help them get more brand awareness quickly because they have so much brand equity, they call it, in that old name. A lot of questions about, like, a Trail Boss plus a 3-liter diesel. Uh, when's that going to happen? You know, the future product news, they won't announce. So I can ask them until I'm blue in the face about future product news. They won't, they won't announce that until they announce it. Or I get behind the scenes information or somebody leaks something. So those questions I really just can't answer. Oh, and this is this is the final uh, thing that was interesting that came up. Um, hybrid. So a gentleman and I have been discussing back and forth, and a couple of people on this have been discussing back and forth, hybrids. So they want to know why GM doesn't build a hybrid. Well, the reality is, is GM's had hybrids since like 2005, the article I found. Um, looking back at Native Guides, at 2005 was the first hybrid Silverado. They've had a hybrid Sierra and Silverado for years. Oh, and they've had an electric truck that in 1998, I think they came up with a Chevy, uh, let's see, that would be the S10, that had electric truck and S10 in those years ago. So Chevy's been doing hybrids for years and years and years. But the question was, why can't they make a Chevy hybrid that gets like 40 miles per gallon, the, the Honda CRV? Well, the challenge with hybrids has always been is that in a passenger's car situation or an a SUV as well, is that your needs are fuel economy top and, you know, as far as uh, recharge is hybrids easy, but fuel economy is number one, dry dynamics and hauling people in the cabin, the one, two, three, right? In a truck world, those are three different things. Fuel economy, yeah, for hybrid, you want to get a better fuel economy, but you can't sacrifice towing and payload because nobody's going to buy a full-size truck that says, okay, you get a 40-mile-per-gallon 40 full-size truck, but you can only haul two people and a bag of rocks. Well, that's not really that big of a demand, right? So you have to understand they're going to build this truck for the majority of people out there. So you have those, have those competing interests. And so, as you said earlier, a truck is a brick on wheels, right? And so aerodynamic problems, you have weight problems. So the CRV weighs about 3,600 pounds. The base level Silverado in the regular cab is 4,000 pounds, and the crew cab is 5,300 pounds. So you almost have 2,000 pounds more on the crew cab versus the CRV, and the crew cab is the best selling configuration right now. So you really want to build a crew cab because people are buying crew cabs like crazy. So to get that 40 miles per gallon, it's a pipe dream at this point. You, the, the towing of the CRV is 1,500 pounds. The minimum for towing in like the full size segment is like 8,000. The minimum and a half in the midsize is like 5,000. So a full-size truck that has, that has capability of a CRV, that doesn't work. And even though they have the technology of a hybrid system and Chevy's got the te te same technology, they just can't put that same application in a full-size truck and get the same towing and payload out of it that you need from a truck. And so it's, it's different consumer needs and different consumer demands. And so um, there's a really big problem with that. But, it, but GM's been, like I said, been doing hybrids for... Years and years and years, I reported on it a couple years ago, they expanded hybrids throughout the country in the, in the 2018 model. They were offering a hybrid package throughout the country. The challenge is nobody's buying them because in a full-size truck, when you look at the numbers, it was one to two mile per gallon better on, high, on I think it was highway. It was maybe one, together, one mile per gallon better highway and two mile per gallon better city. I don't know. You guys can tell me the numbers below. But it, very small fuel economy improvements, and the price point was about three grand more. There wasn't a business case for the consumers. There wasn't enough of a difference there to really make uh, consumers go, yeah, I want the hybrid. I'm, the consumers aren't going, I'm going to pay the premium for the hybrid because I want one mile per gallon better. Nobody did that. And so Chevy's been trying and trying for years. 
y'all just aren't buying them. That's the biggest problem. You want to know why Chevy doesn't offer one? Well, you just buy one. They've been trying to sell them. You guys just don't buy them. And I don't blame you. The numbers aren't there. Uh, so another question to come up. Why is there no short bed single cab option available? Cafe. Cafe and emissions. So cafe is corporate average fuel economy. And what they do is look at the fuel economy across your lineup. So a short bed regular cab has a very small pr- footprint. It's a very small truck. And cafe is based on footprint. So if you take, um, yeah. So say this is a short bed regular cab truck, right? The fuel economy in this truck has to be better than a larger vehicle because it's based on footprint. That's why passenger cars have to get 30 miles per gallon because a smaller car like the Corolla or the uh, Cruze, but they used to build a Cruze, um, has to get such better fuel economy because it's based on cafe. So this vehicle here, say this is a full-size crew cab truck, this doesn't have the same high demands for fuel economy as this one. It's much easier to build a vehicle that hits the fuel economy numbers of the larger size than is large than this size. So let's put this number together. So let's say this one you need to hit 25 miles. You need to have 23 miles per gallon, you know, combined. Say in this full size crew cab, you might need 32 in this one, and you got to use the same powertrain because you can't use a different powertrain in this one and this one, and because you'd have four or five different powertrains, and then economics of scale. You want to build one truck, one powertrain, one transmission choice because that's the most profit. So short bed regular cab went away when the cafe got more stringent and emissions got more stringent. It doesn't. This just isn't possible anymore because of the footprint sizing. Yeah, and if you're saying popular configuration, uh, crew cab or regular cab short bed might seem popular, but the tech creator is different. So it's like tech rates, but the number of people that buy that configuration. So if you look at like manual transmissions, why they went away. Well, you're looking at about 5% of most truck manufacturers or less were selling manual transmission trucks. Now, you can argue dealers weren't ordering them. We'd also argue dealers order stuff that people buy, and they saw people weren't buying manuals. So the death of manuals and the death of short cab, regular red cabs are really because of uh, consumer demand and also cafe. So there you go. There are my answers to some of your questions on the round one of all these questions you just sent in. So I'm going to take and, uh, like I said, work with Chevrolet and get the rest of your answers to your questions there's a lot of good ones especially on like some financing questions heavy duty some questions about the temperature range of the diesel questions about the wet belt and the back of the duramax diesel the 3.0 liter uh gosh, that is just all sorts of questions a two two speed transfer case versus one speed speed transfer case and two wheel drive four wheel drive and i thought some really good insightful stuff so i'm going to go ahead and make sure to get those out to you guys as fast as i can but i kind of want to give you this update as things are going also, hit me up uh, for more questions and more things you want to answer at Tim at PickupTruckTalk.com. If you want to see other manufacturers or you have different questions, I plan on doing this quite a bit because I think it's pretty helpful for all of us to get the right answers and get the information out there. So I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I hope you got a lot of value out of it. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you down the road.